heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 131, covering the week of July 23rd through July 27, 2018. Glad to have you back on the program. Glad to be here. Don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute. You can like us on Facebook at Abbeville Institute. And, of course, you can subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville Institute. If you go to our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org, at the top of the page, you'll find all our social media buttons. Give us an email address, and we'll give you a free ebook for Patrick Sales Emancipation Hell. And you'll get our daily dose of Dixie, Monday through Friday, and our weekly email on Saturday or Sunday with a link to this podcast. Also, you should get our app. Go to your favorite app store and pick up the Abbeville Institute on the go. Just search for Abbeville Institute. You'll get our app, which has all of our lectures and, of course, a link to this podcast as well. Okay. All that said, uh, one thing I want to mention before we get started today uh, is the new bumper music we have. In fact, that's a piece, a banjo piece uh, entitled Last Chance. It was performed by Barrow Weary at our 2018 summer school it's a fantastic piece. We had a lot of great music at that summer school, not only Barrow. Uh, Barrow was not presenting. He was actually considered to be one of our students, uh, but he is a fantastic banjo and fiddle player. He had a gourd banjo, which is pretty cool. Uh, but then we also had Alan Harrelson there, who, of course, is a, a Grammy-nominated banjo player. We had Bobby Horton for our uh, banquet talk. We had uh, Frank Clark, who is a fantastic guitar player. Um, also, uh, Tom Daniel, who is a presenter who who's a musician. So we had a lot of great musicians there. Our summer school is well worth your time. Uh, Our next summer school is going to be July uh, 21st through 26th in 2019. So you're going to want to go. And we also have another conference coming up uh, in November. I'll give you the date here in just one second. It will be, uh, let's see, November 9th through 10th. It'll be in Texas. Uh, We'll have more information about that on the website here very shortly. But you're going to want to go to that, too. So you want to go to Abbeville Institute events. It is a great time. You meet a lot of like-minded people. And uh, we try to do things that are highly entertaining. It's not just a bunch of stuffy ac- academics. So uh, get on out there to our summer school. If you've got students who might be interested, high school, college, or, or you know, undergraduate or graduate students, we'd love to see them at an Abbeville Institute summer school. All right, well, let's talk about the week that was at the Institute, July 23rd through the 27th. We had a lot of interesting pieces this week. And... One of the things that I think unified these pieces together and really brought them together was this idea of perception versus reality. And it's something I talk a lot about in my courses uh, when I teach at the the college level. There's always a perception, and then there's always reality. And when you think about particular decades in American history, for example, if I said the 1950s, that's probably going to conjure up images for you. And in one way or another, you're going to think about something from the 50s or even the 60s. Um, you can do that a lot with, with current American history. If I say to you the 1860s, you'd probably come up with an image, or even the 1770s. There are certain decades or periods in American history that conjure up an image. If I say to you things like the Old West or the Roaring Twenties, it's going to conjure up an image. Now, a lot of those images are based on popular media whether it's modern popular media or whether it's historic popular media, it's the way the media portrays these things and that's, that often gives you the perception that you have of a particular time in history. This is memory. And as John Lukacs said, this is you know, history is the remembered past. And so now you have people like David Blight running around out there talking about memory studies. But that's all that history ever is. History is the way you remember things. And sometimes that memory can be clouded by uh, the present. It can be clouded by the way you think about things now. Or it could be a perception of things and the way they were happening then, and you remember perfectly well the way you remembered it. But somebody else will come along and say, that's not how it happened at all. This is how I remember it. Now, with a lot of events, there's no conclusive proof to say that one or the other is correct. There's simply memory. And memory is very important when it comes to tradition. And one of the things you find with certain times in American history, certain time periods in American history, is that memory is often used as a weapon. The way that one group, particularly the victorious group, prefers to remember something is the way that we all are forced to remember something. And I think the best example of that is the war itself. But not only that, 
It's all of American history and the way that we think about and conceptualize American history. There's a, there's a memory for that. And that memory is dictated by New England. To this very day, we have a New England memory of events in American history. One of the talks at the, at the summer school by uh, Kerry Roberts talked about this. He said, look, what we have today is the New England victory in America. We live in New England. This is why everyone's always upset about everything, because not even New England likes New England. In fact, this is why all these New Englanders move to the South to get away from New England, but what yet they don't realize is they're bringing New England with them. They can't get away from New England. They, what really vexes them is not where they live, it's the people and the culture that they have. It's themselves. They vex themselves. It's not the South that vexes them. It's themselves that is vexed. It's not New England, really. But it's not the place. I mean, New England itself, the, uh, the climate is wonderful in the summertime. Who wouldn't want to live in New England in the summer? Uh, but it's the people there that make New England rotten. And it's the people that create the culture and the political climate. This is, what, this is where they're vexed. They just don't like where they are. And wherever they go, they bring all that with them. So they can never get away from it. So why don't they just all stay in New England? And therefore, they don't have to worry any of us in other places of the country with their uh, terrible culture. But this is the issue in America. And the way they've portrayed American history, the way they remember American history, has become the fashionable way to remember American history. And a nice example of that is, of course, the war itself. It is a righteous cause. And that righteous cause myth is much more powerful, potent, and dangerous than the quote-unquote lost cause myth. Because the righteous cause myth has been adopted by both parties, Democrats, Republicans, both ends of the political spectrum, left and right. And this is now used to justify all kinds of things in America that the founding generation never would have thought the general government should do. And so if you don't subscribe to the righteous cause myth, then you are an insignificant other and you must be uh, educated, schooled on the proper way to think about the past. You have to go to re-education, in other words, to think, come up with a proper way to think about the past. And one of the things we're doing at the Institute is trying to undo that re-education or that, that education you get in your schools that talk about this righteous cause myth. And so we've got more of this next week, and this is, this is going to kind of bridge into that, but um, there are several pieces this week that tangentially get into that. So it's, uh, this is an overarching theme. This is a real problem in America, the way we remember things, and the way that we remember things is often dictated by New England. It's dictated by the Yankee righteous cause myth of American history. So... When you take things like, uh, well, we'll just start with some of the articles. You take things like uh, literature. Even Southerners, Southerners who are not necessarily accurately de depicting something, can be guilty of different memories. And the first piece is by Kurt Fromherz. It's um, entitled Nationally Acclaimed, Locally Detested. It's about George Washington Cable. And George Washington Cable was a writer from New Orleans, though he wasn't originally from New Orleans. Um, he moved there. Of course, he did serve in the Confederate uh, uh, military. And uh, he was a very popular Southern writer. But he was popular. He was popular because, uh, because the North liked George Washington Cable. And the interesting thing about this is that Cable created something out of thin air that didn't exist, the term Creole, which everyone thinks means a racially mixed people. But that's not what Creole actually means. These are people of, of French and Spanish origin that were living in Louisiana and also other parts of the Caribbean as well. Creoles were not just people of mixed race, that would happen eventually. But at first, these were the old families that lived in Louisiana. And so Cable wrote uh, a book that did a lot to create this myth 
of Louisiana culture. And it's something we actually talked about at the, at the uh, summer school as well. There was a, an excellent presentation on uh, Cajun music. And there were several, in, several individuals in, the, in attendance who are from Louisiana. We have a, we have a pretty strong group of supporters from, from that state. And we started talking about these terms, Creole, Cajun, what these things mean. And uh, how important they are to our understanding of this particular part of the South, Louisiana. For example, P.G. T. Beauregard was a Creole. He wasn't a mixed race, but he was a Creole because of his French heritage, you see. And so when you look at Louisiana, you have all these old French families and Spanish families there as well. These are the Creoles. It's, it's not just mixed race. And so what happened is he wrote this book um, that was widely accepted, widely accepted uh, in the North, the Grandismes. And um, why, it was, it was uh, re released in 1880. Uh, a, a it's subtitled The Story of Creole Life. And a lot of Creoles in New Orleans took offense to this book because they said this is not what life is in New Orleans. These are not what the Creole people are. These were Creoles themselves. And they said this is, this is not an accurate portrayal of the South. But, of course, it was picked up across the North as the quintessential study of Creole culture. And that's interesting because the North... As Clyde Wilson has said, you know, the North had this romantic, they liked moonlight and magnolias, they liked mint and juleps, and they liked these things that supposedly were true. But Cable, who's a progressive writer, was writing something that simply just wasn't true. So Southerners can be guilty of the same thing that Northerners can be found guilty of, which is stretching the truth to make a buck. Um, and... Uh, uh, his Cable's mother is actually from New England, and they moved from Indiana to New Orleans in 1837. Um, but he was not necessarily accurate here in his portrayal of Creole culture. And so this is the memory. What kind of memory do we have? If you said to someone today, uh, you know, this person's a Creole, they're going to think you're talking to someone of mixed race, and that could be the case. But the original definition of Creole was someone of French or Spanish descent in Louisiana. That's it. That's all it meant. And um, uh, one of the interesting uh, situations, we actually talked about this at the summer school as well, in the Plessy v. Ferguson case, uh, you know, uh, Homer Plessy was, was a Creole. And at that point, what happened was, at that point, after that case, Creoles were then defined as uh, people of color. And so this is why you got this mix of jazz music, where you had European instruments put with blues, a blues form, and you get jazz. And that's a creation made, as, as Tom Daniel said, that's the only form of music that the Supreme Court ever made in America. And we're going to have these lectures online. I mean, these, the, the talks were just wonderful. I, I can't get enough, I can't say enough how good the talks were at the summer school this past year. Fantastic time talking about Southern music. But here we have a nice representation of this as well. And our memory of New Orleans is dictated by a falsehood, by George Washington Cable, a Southerner himself, who essentially made this stuff up in the uh, 1880s. Now, moving on from there, some of the other pieces we had this week. The, the book review for this week was um, of a book uh, entitled Maximilian and Carlotta, Europe's Last Empire in Mexico. The review is by uh, Terry Halsey. But the thing that's interesting about this book, the title of the review is Confederates in Mexico. And a lot of people don't realize uh, what happened. That A lot of Confederates went to Mexico. They also went to places like Brazil, some went to Europe, but there was a certainly a movement out of the United States or out of the South into other parts of the world. And Mexico was attractive because of Emperor Maximilian. And I think Mr. Halsey does a fantastic job in explaining what Maximilian was. I mean, he really was a conservative European aristocrat, a real monarch in, uh, in Mexico, and he was undermined by the North. 
once the North was finished beating up on the South, then they started involving themselves in this uh, this war in Mexico over control of the Mexican government. And they sided with uh, some individuals in Mexico who were um, uh, not as aristocratic as Maximilian. And, and th- so that's... That's an interesting story, and he gets into all of this, uh, the Juaristas uh, in, in, uh, in Mexico. And that undermined the government of Maximilian. Now, on the other hand, the Juarista armies um, would say that, uh, well, these people were foreign invaders and we were getting rid of them. Um, and so this is where you know the North was certainly interested in foreign policy-wise. I mean, this is this is the beginning of American imperialism. Well, we're going to spread liberty and democracy, our version of it, wherever we can, and why not in Mexico? There was also the uh, American interest in the uh, independence movement in Crete, of all places, I mean, during this time period. But these were, this was part of it, and of course, Southerners then were uh, uh, essentially another, uh, found themselves without a country again after they had gone to Mexico, then they're gone. Um, so this is a very interesting part of Southern history, and the fact that Southerners, uh, who were willing to go there uh, to get away from the Union, now they can't anymore. And of course, Matthew Fontaine Murray uh, was uh, one of these Southerners, one of the most one of the most famous Americans in the world in the 1860s. Uh, was interested in colonizing Southerners in Mexico, and this was even going on during the war. In fact. Um, he was trying to float a plan that um, if Southerners went there, they would uh, they would be allowed to bring their slaves as indentured servants, and then those indentured servants would have to be freed in a certain number of years. So it was a gradual emancipation that he was pursuing in, in Mexico itself, and this just never worked out. But there's all these interesting nuances to uh, Mexico, Mexico's relationship with the United States, Mexico's relationship with the Union government, Mexico's relationship with the Southern, with, with Southerners and the Confederate government, all this going on, which was um, certainly a very uh, unique part of American history and Southern history as well. So I highly recommend reading this review. It's a, it's a fantastic piece, and I think uh, Mr. Halsey, who's a very good writer, does a nice job exploring these issues in, in good detail. So this is, again, perception and reality. Perception and reality. Southerners, I mean, Murray was saying, look, we'll, we'll emancipate our slaves. It's just going to take us a few years to do it. Uh, we're going to do it gradually. And this is what Lincoln had wanted, too. I mean, there's, there's no difference in that position than what Lincoln originally wanted uh, during the war itself when he floated <clears throat> ideas of compensated emancipation and uh, things of that nature. So... Um, this is not unique, and that's, that's, the, that's another thing. It's not unique. Uh, the way that the North ended slavery was unique in that it took a war to do it. Everywhere else in the Western world did it without bloodshed and did it gradually. Uh, but in the, in the United States, it was done through force and immediately, which uh, you could argue might have created some long-standing problems in America and how things were done. I think people on the left and the right recognize that, uh, that the way things were done was perhaps problematic uh, long term uh, because it did create some social, political, and economic dynamics that uh, have been hard to overcome in, in America. Now, there's perception reality there. There's perception reality even in modern uh Southern society, and this is a piece by Michael Arnheim, Time for the South to Ban Affirmative Action. And he gets into this. This is a very interesting piece, current events, um, and he talks about how Jeff Sessions, who's now Attorney General, has gone out and um, issued some opinions or issued uh, his, his his thoughts on, on uh, affirmative action and how I mean, he's going to start scaling back enforcement of these things. And, of course, there are states out there that have gone after affirmative action. He asks, he asks the question, why haven't some southern states or no other southern states besides Florida followed suit and started to peel back 
affirmative action laws. And he even brings up uh, Clarence Thomas, who's in the South, saying, look, affirmative action didn't do anything for me. It's it's bad for black Americans. And, and Arnheim does a good job in bringing up the historically black colleges that have law schools in the South that produce uh, excellent lawyers. Um, and he talks about myths and reality and s- test scores and other things, but certainly the thing that's important about this is that um, when you look at perception reality, that the perception is that the South wouldn't have anything like these historic black universities or black colleges, and they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't have these type of institutions set up because, of course, Southerners would just be all racist and they wouldn't want these things. This actually gets into that period of time in the late 19th century when all these schools were being founded in the South in, in, after the war and how important it was. And, you know, when you look at Macon County, Alabama, where Tuskegee Institute is located, it's one of these historic black universities or colleges. Um, people in Macon County, African-Americans in Macon County could vote all the time. They were never barred from voting. Um, and the, the call for the civil rights movement always was colorblind. But what we have in affirmative action is not that. Um, and so even when you look at the Plessy v. Ferguson case, which I just mentioned before, 1896, uh, Justice Harlan said our, our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. But that's not what these laws do. And so um, this is a nice piece that gets into some of the legal wrangling with affirmative action. And Arnheim's just asking, why haven't Southerners pursued this in a federal way? I mean, this is this is really a federalism issue. Why haven't southern states gone out and done more with it? That's a very good question. Um, and I think some of it has to do with the fact that southerners are more interested in national solutions than they let on. And that's just because they've been conditioned to think that way. Everyone in America has. This perception reality again. Everyone in America has been conditioned to think that every issue is a national issue. Quote, unquote, national issue. When in reality, it's not. Not every issue is a national issue. Most issues, in fact, I think you could argue that anything besides commerce and defense are all local issues. But that's not how we think of things in America. If we have a problem, we have to go sue in federal court because our Bill of Rights, or our, our, our rights under the Bill of Rights have been violated. I mean, this is preposterous, but this is what people do. And so to have these laws... What the states could do more with it shows that we have a perception and reality problem in America. Now, the piece on Thursday doesn't necessarily fit, at least on the surface, doesn't fit with this. It's about tobacco. The Dukes of Hazzard, uh, uh, Jack Marcourt, who is our resident scholar in Japan, talks about um, how tobacco is bad for your health. This is true. Tobacco, though, was also one of the biggest industries in the South, and um, I worked in quote-unquote big tobacco for a few years before I got back into education. And it's an interesting industry, and I'm not going to say who I worked for or what I did, but it's an interesting industry, um, to say the least. A lot of money in tobacco, but tobacco is one of those industries that helped save the South after the war. I mean, I think it's one that needs uh, a lot of attention, scholarly attention, because it really was one of the most Southern industries out there. Uh, when James Bonsack invented his cigarette rolling machine, it revolutionized the South because not only did you have the, the Duke family, which uh, this article gets into, but also you had uh, Richard J. Reynolds, the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company, uh, and many, many others. But Reynolds and uh, the Duke uh, Company, which later became American Tobacco, were the big two. And um, you had, of course, other forms of tobacco. You had chewing tobacco and snuff and but, you know, when you had your cigarette rolling machines, now that you could pre-roll cigarettes, this really revolutionized the way that people consume tobacco products. People still were chewing tobacco. Uh, they were still using snuff. Um, and they were still using uh, what we now call dip. Um, but cigarettes were a huge, huge industry in the South. And, uh, I mean... Even in the 90s, when, when all these uh, anti-smoking laws were being pushed through and more states were adopting that, if you went to Virginia, which was a you know, cigarette co- country, you still would smoke in every public building. 
Now, I'm sure that's not the case today, but 1990s it certainly was. Everybody smoked everywhere. Uh, and without cigarettes, without the tobacco industry, the South might have been drastically different, would have been drastically different in the Reconstruction period in terms of economics. So we cannot discount the role that tobacco had as, as bad as the product can be for your health. It certainly had a beneficial effect on the Southern economy uh, in terms of uh, farmers, factory workers, companies, uh, employees of these particular companies. Um, and that's something I've written about for the web website before. Fire Cure Darkleaf was the uh, article that I wrote, and this was years ago, probably about four years ago. Uh, but certainly the um, the cigarette industry does, does deserve some scrutiny. I mean, this is this stuff was not good for you. But he also uh, Jack also brings up some interesting points about Japan and how uh, you know America was exporting the product and things like that. So it's a very interesting piece and one that is well worth your time reading. And then we concluded the week with a piece by John Devaney. Uh, John again was one of Clyde Wilson's doctoral students, and uh, this brings up this whole thing of a perception. And I love his concluding sentence in this particular piece. He says that um, we view the war not only as an American event, but a singular American event. He says it is unwise that we do so. So what he's trying to do is provide context. That there are other things that went on in, in the world at that time. The German unification movement, the Italian unification movement, also Argentina, Brazil were going through some of these things that were just like the American war between the states, or as he calls it in this particular piece, uh, the late unpleasantness, as they say in certain parts of uh, South Carolina. But again, this gets back into memory. How to remember this thing? How to remember this war that cost a million people? How do we do that? How do we have uh, a common vernacular about this war when you have one group advancing the righteous cause mythology, and a smaller group, of course, saying that's incorrect. I guess when one group, the righteous cause mythology people, are able to push the other group out, which I think is what they are trying to do, ultimately, to have, quote-unquote, consensus on what these things mean, maybe we'll all call it the Civil War at that point. But as long as things like this podcast exist and our website exists, that's just not going to be the case. We're going to have our, our own opinions of the war and what it means and, and uh, how we conceptualize the war, how we remember the war, how we remember American history. We'll have our own vision of that. Because remembering something, it's, I've, I've said it before, if you want to be regarded as a mortal, have somebody remember you. Be remembered. It's very important. And when we look at Southern history, remember Southern history. Our myths are not really myths. They're our memory of things. And to us, and I think you can prove it most of the time, they're the truth. Until next time, good day. Good day.